Hold on. That's the last call, <laughs> or the second last call <laughs> for the session to start. Uh, we'll have to finish it, um, unfortunately, at the same time it was supposed to finish, so it will end at 7. Uh, so we have less time. Um, All right, so, so this, um, this panel, um, it's a very good question. Okay, um, thank you very much for coming. Uh, we have three excellent speakers. Uh, Eric Berglov, John Herbst, and Luke Conway. And um, um, we'll be talking about European future of Ukraine. And uh, we have 15 minutes per person, 12 minutes per person. I apologize for the delays. There is a technical constraint from the other session coming in. Um, and uh, Eric, the floor is yours. Oh. You want to start? Oh, me. Oh, okay. Okay. We'll start. Okay. okay. Uh, first of all, thanks. So first of all, you know, I'm a, just an absolute academic. I'm not illustrious like my other guests. So you can basically ignore what I say. You can space out. All power to you. Um, so I was asked to talk about the European future of Ukraine. Uh, we can think of Europe in two ways, as institutional Europe, as the EU, but we can also think of Europe as an idea, as a cultural process, and um, as a movement away from Russia towards Europe. And you know, the, coming here after a while, this is really the Huntingtonian moment in Ukraine, clash of civilizations. You really feel it everywhere. There's sort of talk about changing the names of towns and streets, and you know, it really feels like the 1990s. And I basically want to talk about the sort of double-edged nature of these civilizational appeals. Um, on the one hand, um, they support reform, you know, sort of talking about integration into Europe helps reform. On the other hand, it, in this context, it can be highly divisive, which is a problem because we're in the middle of a war here. First, you know, it supports reform, um, pro-European ideas, uh, kind of pro were behind the Orange Revolution, they were behind Euromaidan. Without them, if they weren't as strong in Ukraine, we'd still have Yanukovych, and I think we can all agree that that's a good thing that we do not have Yanukovych. Uh, second, I think, you know, talking about the return to Europe or going towards Europe encapsulates a lot of diverse reforms, democratic, institutional, administrative, so it helps you sell reform, which is very important. And finally, sort of nationalism, as we see in East Asia, has been very important, scholars say, to the success of economic reform, uh, economic there in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the Asian tigers. But I want to say is that these appeals also in the Ukrainian context have a darker side, that they're highly divisive. Um, to start off with, it's worth mentioning that support for European integration uh, while Yanukovych was in power until the fall of Yanukovych was in fact never supported by a clear majority of Ukrainians. So it did more to divide Ukraine than to uh, unite it. Uh, that's no longer the case as much anymore. I think after the uh, fall of Yanukovych, the war, you know, Russia did more to, to promote U European ideas than anybody, but uh, Putin did more to promote Ukraine, uh, European ideas than anybody. Since the invasion, you've had a significant increase in support for European integration and a significant decrease in support for the customs union. Um, and indeed, support for EU now is high relative to, to Central Asian countries, Central European countries, such as Croatia, and, uh, and, um, and Turkey. It's, uh, so in that sense, it's good. On the other hand, there's still a stark regional variation in terms of support uh, for the European Union. And even more significantly, uh, what we've witnessed in the new Ukraine is a stark disengagement of the Eastern and uh, pro-Russian population. Uh, turnout in the East has gone down radically. That, I would argue that's not simply the f a function of the fact that parts of turnout were, were manufactured under, under Yanukovych, but it's more also a fact of the fact that under Yanukovych you had an incredibly well-organized party of regions. Even the uh, Committee of Voters of Ukraine thought that party of regions had one of the best interactions with voters. They're hardly biased towards Yanukovych. And basically what happened in late February was that this party that mobilized support in the East utterly collapsed. And so as a result, you have um, the uh, marginalization of pro-Russian forces, which is unique 
in post-Soviet Ukrainian history, pro-Russian forces have literally become a minority counterculture. Now, I think many of you in this room think, well, what's the problem, right? Isn't it good now that the Eastern Ukrainians don't vote? Isn't it good now that pro-Russian forces are so marginalized? Um, does not support reform? Well, I think, it, you know, it's, that's, uh, there's something to that point of view. On the other hand, if you want to create an inclusive democratic Ukraine, I think we should be troubled by the lack of engagement of Eastern Ukrainians. And we should do more to encourage that. And I can tell you what doesn't encourage that is this sort of, this, this, um, this, this sort of civilizational appeals. Um, but even more problematic, I think, is the recent effort to legislate ideological purity. Um, in this, I'm referring to the anti-totalitarian laws, um, which I understand are gonna be signed by Poroshenko and were supported by almost all the pro-government parties. Um, now, there are good parts to these laws. It sort of opens up archives, no argument there. Uh, but obviously, there are other parts that are more controversial, um, including the ban on the denial of legitimacy of, of fighters for Ukrainian independence, including the Aung Nupa, as well as the ban on the denial of the criminal nature of the communist regime. Now, um, so these laws have been amended. It's now um, thankfully le legal to sell uh, pioneer pins on the street. Um, I, I met with the, uh, someone from the presidential administration yesterday and he personally assured me that I would not be arrested if I criticized Aung Nupa, which is a big relief. So, um, but that really misses the point because the law is likely to be followed as much as every other law in Ukraine, which is not that much. Right, so you know, I mean, I think hopefully the opening the archives will, but the more controversial parts about banning um, the denial of legitimacy of, or banning the denial of criminality of the, of the uh, Soviet regime are probably not likely to be followed. So it's, most supporters admit that it's a purely symbolic law. Um, but that in itself I think is problematic. I mean, listen, Ukrainians, whether we like it or not, have very different views on their history. And what this law does is it politicizes those differences. So rather than allowing Ukrainians not to forget the past, but to work it out to, you know, to be convinced, it legislates a particular interpretation of history. And in a sense, it reflects a lack of faith in liberalism, in the marketplace of ideas. Now, no one's gonna be convinced in Eastern Ukraine by a law that bans this kind of view. So all it does is it polarizes the situation. What it denies is the fact that there's so much that unites Ukraine. There was a recent poll by Democratic Initiatives. Independence unites Ukraine. Victory of Ukraine over the Nazis in World War II uh, unites Ukraine. What does not unite Ukraine is Stepan Bandera, Aounupa. And also what does not Ukraine, unite Ukraine is the attitude towards the collapse of the Soviet Union in fact. Um, in Dnepropetrovsk, the, the poll showed that more, that more people in Dnepropetrovsk you know, regret the collapse of the Soviet Union than, than support it. So I think this is not the time when we want to keep Dnepropetrovsk in Ukraine to support changing its name because the name, it was named during the Soviet period. And in general, you know, I'm an outsider, and um, I hope you don't consider this condescending, but um, I, I think I would just make an appeal to recognize that you know, in the time of war, it's important to focus on what unites the country, not what divides it. And in a sense, um, you know, all the more so right now. So. Okay, thank you for um, inviting me to this, this uh, panel. So, so I'm going to take a slightly different interpretation of the title. I, I um, uh, read it, Ukraine and the Future of Europe. And, and for me, Ukraine is very much about the future of Europe. So what happens in Ukraine and what happens, what comes out of this um, uh, conflict that uh, we are seeing now, uh, what the outcome of that will be will be of incredible importance for the future of Europe. I had some slides, but I, I don't know if they are coming on. Great. So, so, it, so it's, I'm sorry, the, the, um, the, uh, the 
design of these slides are it's a bit dark so but uh, it, it, you should it, you shouldn't int over interpret this but um, so so, um, so so it's really in many ways uh, what's going on in Ukraine now and what what is putting a such additional pressure on Ukraine is in a way is not so much about Ukraine it's about a long-term conflict between Europe and, and Russia, which has been building up for, for a long time. Of course, it's also about Ukraine, but it's really about uh, that conflict, that resolution of, of, of that conflict. And uh, whether reform succeeds or not in Ukraine is going to be incredibly important for what's happening in Russia, in, in my view. And um, also, what happens in, in Russia is going to be very important for the future of, of Ukraine. So, um, but as I said, it's also about uh, Europe's own future. So that's going to be basically the arguments I'm making. So, so I just, you know, to get, put in perspective what's going on in, in Ukraine right now in, in terms of the economy. So Ukraine, if everything goes the way we, we predict it, uh, it's, Ukraine is going to be the poorest country in Europe at the end of this year. So. I think that's something, you know, against that background, we, we must uh, see um, economic reforms. So, uh, of course, there are many reasons for why we see this uh, done now and, and uh, you know, what, but, um, and, and of course, some of this has to do with what's happened uh, in, the, in the East, in, in, in the loss of productive capacity, but it's also, I think, a wake-up call to the to the severity of, of, of the challenge that we, we have in this country. And of course, as we said many times already during this conference, you know, this, this was not always the case. Ukraine, Poland, Belarus were all more or less at the same level um, when transition started. So there's clearly a, a need to, um, to do um, uh, reforms. See if we can get this. So, so you, So, so um, I say four key reform areas here is actually five. So I, th I think just to you know, the things that I see, you know, trying to focus on, on you know, what, what can be achieved. So I think what's the reforming the monetary policy, uh, getting uh, MBU uh, in, in, uh, in shape, I think that is something that has started and, and is on, uh, underway. Uh, the restructuring of the banking system has started, is underway, but there are still you know, very significant uh, challenges left. The energy sector, again, has started. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, remarkable what has been achieved in, in, a, in a relatively short time in terms of, of uh, NAFTA gas, and, and there are very important reforms underway. Constitutional reform, I think we are not seeing as much progress as we would like on, on the issue of decentralization. Uh, civil service reform, uh, I think we, we have had discussions today about you know, the extent of civil service reform, extent of, of judicial reform, and, and, and the extent of, of, of lustration. I think there, is, there has definitely been some progress, but, but it's not uh, going uh, maybe all um, uh, as, as we had wanted to do. But um, the, so, so so, so, so why, why do we think that um, this uh, time is different? Well, as, as also many people have said during this uh, conference, it's a stronger sense of national identity. There is a, a clear uh, endorsement of the European uh, orientation. But uh, as we just heard also, there has been maybe a reinforcement to some extent of these differences. And, and certainly there is part of Ukraine that is not um, embraced or inclu included uh, as strongly in, in that um, uh, sort of reaffirmation of, of the national identity and the European integration and, and the, the participation in, in East Ukraine has, has, has not developed in the way one would have liked. Uh, I think there is a, also now a committed and a, a relatively clean government and there is very much a radicalized civil society and all those things make it different. But also the death of the uh, economic and financial crisis me means that it's, you know, it's more difficult to, to, to uh, make progress uh, uh, at this time. There is um, you know, very low institution quality uh, uh, still, and there is uh, uh, political infighting, and, and this cohabitation has many downsides, as, as we know, and, and uh, it's, it's, 
there's a lot of uh, waste in, in that process and, and issues that could have been resolved uh, in, in a more uh, rational way are, are, are being uh, delayed and so on. The, the, whole, the weakness of the Russian economy, ironic, ironically, is also, of course, affecting uh, Ukraine, both because of the trade and, and, and of course, the, also the, the, and I come back to that, I mean, what's the reaction in, in, um, in Russia to what's happening to the Russian economy also affects how they relate to Ukraine. And, of course, the fighting in the East makes all this, you know, much more difficult. So, so um, I, th I thought just this is escape from, from, um, from post-Soviet legacy, which has been the sort of uh, the slogan of this conference, and, and I, you know, it's, it's, it's obvious, but it's, you know, this, the escape is not enough. It's, it's, uh, you, you, there needs to be a sense of direction and a sense of, uh, you know, we're not just running away from something. We are trying to to move in, in some uh, direction. And I hear, I think this is where Europe uh, comes in. It's not that Europe is going to present all the solutions and present uh, all the, um, uh, make all the decisions, but it's here where, where I think there is a, a chance to, to solve some of the institutional uh, dilemmas and some of the, uh, create the consensus around some of the key institutional choices is in, in, um, in the direction towards, um, uh, towards Europe. But of course, you know, we, these decisions had ultimately to be taken uh, by Ukrainians. But so, since uh, the energy has to come from within, but uh, that could be uh, an, a sense of direction from uh, Europe. So, um, I, I won't go into to, to this is the, the sanctions. I just want to say that the, the issues of, of Russia has clearly, in the, 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 what's happened to Russia is, is very dramatic in the sense that uh, the, the sanctions, we, I don't think many people thought that they would be as effective as they have been. And, and uh, it's not only about the sanctions themselves, but also about the uncertainty about future sanctions and about the, uh, what, what it means. I, I was, as you know, working uh, for the EBRD when we became a sanctions tool. And you, you really saw how once you, you, you get affected by sanctions, you need to take quite a bit of, of um, margin in, in your decision making to make sure that you're not in any sense violating any sanctions. And that's what we're seeing in so many organizations working uh, in, in Russia now and, and working, uh, um, possibly trading and investing in, in Russia. Uh, they are, have to take this um, uh, decision. So, so, so let me um, end with, so, so uh, on, on a reflection on, on um, what's happening in, in terms of the, the broader uh, political climate and, and, and geopolitical climate in Europe. So, you know, we, we took this uh, peace uh, dividend uh, uh, from the fall of, of the Berlin Wall and the end of the Cold War as, 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 as a given. It has helped tremendously in, in, uh, in weathering uh, the crisis, in, uh, crisis during transition. You know, the fact that we've had uh, you know, one to two percent, this point, lower uh, defense expenditures over a long uh, series of years have certainly helped. But also the, the whole normalization of trade and investment patterns, we have taken them for granted. And what we are seeing right now is, is really a reversal of, of these, uh, I call it this geopolitical tax that's being imposed again. It's about uh, defense expenditures increasing. We have. We, we know that the Ukraine itself wants to double its defense expenditures by 2020. You know, until now, basically no uh, country in Eastern Europe has lived up to its commitment. Uh, in, 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 none of the NATO members in Eastern Europe have lived up to their commitments of, of 2% of GDP. And, and that uh, uh, is, is something that uh, we're now seeing more and more countries making uh, that commitment. We are seeing uh, a discussion of, of um, uh, NATO membership in in, uh, in, uh, in Northern Europe in a way that we haven't seen before, and, and of course defense expenditure. So it's so it's a very extensive uh, impact. Uh, we also see distortions in trade and investment flows. We you know we see redundancies being created in terms of, of uh, energy, in terms of, of uh, payment uh, systems. Uh, 
We also see, which I think is very fundamental when you talk about uh, the investment climate and, and, and so on, is systemic uncertainty increasing. So we don't really know for sure what, where we are going, and, and that I think is affecting uh, many, many key decisions. Let me. Uh, so, so just end on, on, on just a couple of words on, on how one can think of, of um, getting out of this, because I, I think this, we are in a very uh, negative s uh, spiral. We, are, we desperately need to find uh, uh, positive sum games, discussions where we can, there is something positive on the table that um, we could uh, uh, engage uh, on. And so one example of, the, of what I have in mind is, is what we tried to do last year in the Ukrainian banking system is the fact that you had Western European banks, you had Russian banks, and you had Ukrainian banks. They were all uh, trapped, in a way, in, 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 in the Ukrainian financial system. The Western, uh, U Western European banks could not withdraw. The Russian bank could not really withdraw. And there was uh, a possibility to... to um, to discuss how to reform the um, Ukrainian banking systems. And there were, starting in June last year, there were meetings where the Russian banks participated, Western European banks participated with the new management of, of the NBU. There were meetings in end of July, and, and in November there was a meeting uh, uh, in Brussels where and not all the Russian banks, but one of the Russian banks uh, uh, came. And I think that's uh, one way of thinking about how we, how we could um, engage. I think the EU, Russia, Ukraine uh, uh, trade agreement was one way where, where how we could make uh, progress. I think that was, an, you know, has been challenged what was achieved, but I think it was a, 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 a positive sum game that had a, a positive um, outcome. That, I think there are poss possibilities now of, of um, trying to uh, get tr trade facilitation programs and so on going, uh, even, even despite uh, the conflicts in, in the East. But we may also have to think much beyond that. You know, for example, one area where, where uh, we saw a lot of uh, pr progress in terms of, of uh, global governance uh, was in, in the management of the Arctic. And with the Ukraine crisis, we saw how this has now more or less imploded. And, and again, there's an area where there is a common interest of those parties in, in, uh, in uh, uh, making progress. So the, we need to find those, those uh, positive sum games where we can make, uh, make progress. Thank you very much. Um, I apologize in advance. I'm going to be speaking at a relatively high level of abstraction. Uh, you know, the title for this event is, is Ukraine going to Europe? And I think that's a missed title. I think the question is, is Ukraine going towards the future? Uh, the notion of Ukraine going to Europe as opposed to Ukraine going to Russia is one more example of a rather naive West accepting the Kremlin terms of the current crisis. Because the values that are driving Ukraine right now, the values that drove the Euromaidan, are values that are necessary for societies to succeed in the next 20, 30, 100 years. This is not an issue of Russian versus European values. This is an issue of values that will, will nurture a society that will develop a modern economy and provide a good life for its citizens. Uh, we live in one of those critical turning points in, in history, in terms of socioeconomic development. We are in an advanced stage, although maybe not so much, we'll know more in 20 or 50 or 100 years, of the information age. You know, you had the Neolithic Revolution, you had the Agricultural Revolution with that, you had the Industrial Revolution, you have the in Information Age Revolution. And, you know, in the last century, in the late 19th century, in the early 20th century, with the concentration of industries, it gave an advantage to either authoritarians or totalitarians who wanted to mobilize their society. And you know, we, we saw these dreadful states emerge, uh, Nazi Germany, various communist states. 
Well, the events of the past 30 years, even more than 30 years, the evolution of the computer, the inter invention of the internet, now social media, have all produced a very different phenomenon. Uh, the individual citizen, as opposed to the centers of power, are being empowered. And this age, more than any other, brings home a fact that has always been true. What's the key to progress is unlocking the human mind, and unlocking the human mind requires letting people alone so they can develop their talents. And the way you succeed today and for the foreseeable future is by doing precisely that and at the same time, because they're related, integrating globally. You know, it's absolutely amazing. It's absolutely amazing the way the Arab Spring morphed from this fishmonger in Tunisia, setting himself aflame because of corruption, how that moved across the Arab world very quickly. That happened because of the social media. We may not like the results of it today, but the phenomenon was a result of the way the global society works. The fact that in very poor Africa, lots and lots of people, most people have cell phones, that they now know what's going on in New York City or in Shanghai. And the, we've faced, or rather we have enjoyed, unprecedented prosperity since the end of the Cold War for, you might say, two big reasons. One I've just talked about, the information age, the way, thing, the, way the economy has developed, um, much enhanced global integration. The other was the peace that was established in Europe and Eurasia. The greatest success story economically of the past 20 or 30 years, and the one that's having the most global impact, is the rise of China. And China did not get where it is today by establishing an autarkic economic system. Exactly the opposite. How does that relate to the topic of today? To the Ukraine-Russia crisis? Or more precisely, the crisis of a reactionary Kremlin? It, it works like this. Civil society in Ukraine, which has been a factor since the first days of independence or the pre-days of independence, has driven this country towards <coughs> Europe in the, way, in, in the current phrase. But it's really driving this country towards openness, towards empowerment of its citizens. That is precisely the opposite direction that Mr. Putin has been leading Russia for the last 10 years. Since he's not an idiot, he poses this as a question of Russian values versus Western values. But it's really reaction versus the future. Reaction versus the future. Uh, who was Steve Jobs 30 years ago? No one. He was a, guy, a kid working in his garage, right? Obviously a man with mathematical talent, right? He became Steve Jobs because he lived in a society which let him develop his idea, and did not have some police captain take it away from him once he turned to profit. Now, the Russian people have produced in the past 50 years, at a very high percentage, com comparatively, the world's great mathematicians and scientists. Right? How many Soviet Nobel laureates were there? Why is there no world-class software firm in Russia? because there are too many police captains and FSB colonels or KGB colonels who will take it away from them once they develop a profit. All that talent has produced world-class hackers, not world-class firms. And where did this Ukraine-Russia crisis begin? <coughs> Over the question of whether Ukraine was going to integrate in some fashion with the EU. And what was the Kremlin objection? Well, we really want to have Ukraine in the European, Eurasian Economic Union, which is a dead end for Russia as it is for every country that would be part of it. China is China because it was able to compete across the global, global economy. There are no world-class innovators in the Eurasian Economic Union. Russia only has the GP, GDP that it has, or the per capita it has, because it has hydrocarbons. Without hydrocarbons, the GNP would be less, excuse me, per capita would be less than Ukraine's because talent there is not allowed to develop. What does this all mean? Again, I'm speaking at a fairly high level abstraction. 
I can't tell you how this current crisis is going to turn out. I have some ideas, but I'm not going to give them to you today. I can tell you this. If Mr. Putin succeeds in Ukraine and he builds his Eurasian Union, he is consigning Russia for, to oblivion for the next 20 to 40 years. Because that's a Russia that will not develop. And that will ultimately come crashing down. And when it comes crashing down, not because the CIA is devising some plot, but because it's not sustainable, just as the Soviet Union came crashing down, Russians will be freed and Ukrainians will be freed. So ultimately, you will find yourselves, you Ukrainians in this audience, will find yourselves on the path to the future. I suspect you'll get there sooner than that. I suspect, and we can talk about it at dinner or some other time, why the current Kremlin project in Ukraine will fail. But the point is, this is not a civilizational crisis. I agree with my speaker, my colleague on the right. This is a crisis between reaction, which is bound to fail, and the future, where there will be progress. Last point. Uh, Kluchevsky said famously, when Russia marches, the Russian people suffer. And that's precisely what's happening today. Repression at home, aggression abroad. Mr. Putin's objectives, I don't think can be met by my colleague on the right suggestions. Mr. Putin's objectives are, as he said, countless times to change the post-Cold War order, to have a Russian sphere of influence. This would be a gas that the United States tried to establish in Latin America. We once had it. You applaud Obama for reconciling. At the same time, some Europeans saying Putin deserves his own sphere of influence. What type of logic is that? And Mr. Putin's objectives go beyond Ukraine. He will ultimately fail because he's, he is piloting an economy which will not be able to sustain his concept of, of empire. But we can make his life much harder and our own lives much better, starting with the Ukrainians, if we halt him now. Thank you. We have a couple of minutes uh, for questions. Yes, please, Timothy. Uh, thank you very much. My question will be to Eric Bergloff, who had been talking about reforms, but I also hope that Mr. Herbst and maybe the panel's moderator will jump in. So uh, my question is about the trade-off. Uh, in Ukraine, we're looking forward to have many liberal reforms, reforms in education, health, land redistribution, and many experts think that these reforms are going to bring economic growth in the long run. But I think from what we know from economic history that in the short run, these kind of reforms, they usually generate shocks for redistribution and meritocracy. And what we also know from the literature that these kind of shocks for meritocracy usually increase corruption and corruption handicaps long run development. So I think now we have to make this conscious choice between two alternative paths. Either we first implement uh, reforms having in mind that they may increase corruption. Or we first kill corruption and then, in time, we launch reforms. I doubt that we can do this simultaneously because this requires a great deal of cooperation between within the government and between government and society. So my question to you would be how would you tackle this paradox? What would be your uh, answer to this issue? Yeah, thank you. Well, I think you are posing the question probably in, in, in the wrong way, but it's, let me try to, to, to uh, address it. So, I think it is true that in the early 90s, in the reforms, in, 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 uh, particularly in Central Europe, but you know, all through the sort of post-Soviet sphere, uh, there was an increase in corruption. Uh, but I, I think it's a, it's a fallacy to say that there is some trade-off between through sort of long-term uh, reforms and 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 uh, or, and and some long-term objectives and and uh, sort of allowing corrup corruption today. So if, if you look at uh, a country like Poland, for example, it it is it did indeed have at least the way we measure it have a, a very significant increase in uh, in corruption uh, in in the early 90s and and along with you know very difficult uh, transitional recession and so on. But you know, starting with in the late 90s and the early 2000s, Poland adopted a lot of reforms. It's not a silver bullet to, to address corruption, but it's, it's about the kind of reforms that 
the, this government in Ukraine is talking about now. It's, it's, it's many, it's about civil service reform, it's about procurement, it's about, you know, it's, it's a whole range of, of issues that uh, Poland managed to address. And today Poland is less corrupt than, than uh, uh, many other countries in, in the old EU. So, so I think there is, this is, there is no uh, contradiction between trying to address these reforms early on. You may have to accept in, in, in a transitional phase that there is some increase, and poss possibly that's what we have seen in, in, in uh, Ukraine as well, that there was something like that. But right now, I think there is all these reforms that are being tried are, are trying to address that. Any other questions? Yes, please. Good afternoon. My name is Vitaly. I'm a KC alumni of 2011. And I have a small question uh, to Mr. Herbst. Uh, could you please tell uh, how do you assess uh, the probability of successful reforms of uh, current Ukrainian government? Do you think they would be really successful? Do you think this, uh, that um, these words that, are, uh, that we hear now from television, from radio, they could uh, be transformed into deeds? Or do you think uh, it's too slowly or it's normal way? Thank you. I think you're right now seeing a serious struggle between um, the real reform elements in Ukraine and those are, are your youngish members of the Rada, um, your new ministers and deputy ministers, um, by and large young, though not, not all, who firmly believe in this, and then the entrenched structures on top, both in the business community and in the bureaucracy and also in the government, um, which, are, which some of them know how to talk a good game about corruption and about reform, but not necessarily to implement it. Uh, under the current crisis, uh, the international community, uh, Western governments, the EU, um, the IFES, the international financial institutions, have more influence here than they might otherwise. And I think if, if those f interested in the West in reform in Ukraine and the folks inside who are interested in reform work together, they increase the chances of serious reform. But it will probably come slower than we would like. Uh, and I think given the state of mobilization of, of civil society in Ukraine and where Ukrainian voters are, if the current government doesn't implement serious reform, uh, you know, there may be a new government at some point. I'm not talking about uh, you know, tomorrow, but in a year, two years, three years. We have time for one more question. Yes, please. Click. Thank you. Uh, Glivoshlinsky, JFK. Uh, question to Mr. Herbst. Uh, you were ambassador of the United States to Ukraine uh, during uh, the first Maidan. Uh, could you please comment on the differences between uh, that time and the uh, current situation? Your uh, uh, expectations uh, towards the future of uh, both revolutions, call them that way. And uh, uh, could you please comment on lessons learned by the West uh, from uh, assistance to Ukraine in both cases? And uh, could, you, could we see something uh, very different this time in terms of uh, Western uh, influence on the process of reforms? Thank you. Uh, that's quite a number of questions. I'll, I'll do my best. Uh, the main difference, well, actually, the similarity between the Orange Revolution and the Euromaidan was the participation of civil society and the ability of political leadership, as already established political leadership, to uh, mobilize or rather to use that civil society to affect a change in power. Uh, so there's something positive and something less positive about, about that commonality, that, that thing that's in common. Um, what's different, and this is to the advantage of today, uh, there are more people committed to reform, 
at higher levels in the government and, uh, than they were 10 years ago. And even the very top leadership is at least a little bit better today than it was then. So that's all positive. Uh, what happens next, or what, what the West has learned? There was much too much euphoria in the West when President Yushiko became president. And although there were some of us who realized that the then new government was com composed of people who were not that much better than the then old government. So there's, there's less euphoria today. There's much more insistence from Western governments to see progress on reform than there was 10 years ago. I mean, we, we paid attention to it, we, we, we were encouraging it, but now because of what happened then, people are, more, are wiser about the prospect of stepping back. Uh, and what's, what's, oh, what's also different between then and now, which is something for the West to take note of and use, and I, I've been saying this for, for months now, uh, since in, after Yushinko won, civil society basically retired for a while. Civil society is not retired now, which means that just like the West, I think Ukrainian public has learned the lessons of, of the failure of the Orange Revolution. And um, there's a natural, natural alliance between the committed reformers here and Westerners, and that's something that should be made stronger. Uh, and of course, the, the last, last point that needs to be mentioned is, well, actually there are two more. Um, one, did you face an enemy today that you didn't then? I mean, the Kremlin was against the Orange Revolution, but they were unwilling to actually send the Red Army into Ukraine. Now they're willing to do that. Um, the good part of that, though, is they have forged a Ukrainian nationalism which did not exist before. Uh, Mr. Putin really is the godfather of modern Ukrainian nationalism. Not just the godfather of Medvedchuk's son. Uh, <laughs> but there's a danger here, too. Um, I agree that this media law, which criminal excuse me, criminalizes um, praise of communism and other things, is a serious mistake, a distraction. And in my, in my remarks, I talked about the future and what's needed for the future. You don't need a return. In fact, you should fight strongly against a return to aggressive or cramped nationalism. One of the great achievements of Ukraine to this date has been its reconciliation with Poland. Uh, you know, the repudiation of the UPA line on the Poles, very, very important to Ukraine. The reconciliation between Ukrainians and Jews, very important to Ukraine, both politically but also to create the type of society that will succeed in the future. And anyway, that's a little bit actually a, a divergence from your question, but still a point worth making. <laughs> anyway, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we have an excellent panel, uh, but we would like to conclude with one little phrase. So, uh, Vox Ukraine is an um, example of an outcome which is only possible because of informational technology and globalization. But there are people on whom we rely and without whom it wouldn't be possible for Vox Ukraine to exist. And uh, we would like to give our thanks to Natalia Shapoval, who is sitting in the back. And I thank you. Thank you very much.